Gospel of Mark, the 14th chapter, Mark chapter 14. We are making our way through the Gospel of Mark. We have come to this 14th chapter and we have arrived at the 22nd verse. We're going to read to verse 26, Mark chapter 14. We read beginning at verse 22. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it, and gave it to them, and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's ask our God's blessing upon our time in his word. Lord, we have gathered today to worship you, to acknowledge who you are, to acknowledge the worth of our God, to acknowledge that we love you and that we need you and that we rest in you, that we are blessed by you. We thank you for the forgiveness of all of our sins. We thank you that everything that we stood in need of from the time of our birth to be reconciled to you and made right with you, you have accomplished in and through your Son. We've gathered today in his name and to give him glory. And we ask that as your word goes forth in this next hour, that that would be the result, that we would see Jesus, that our Savior would be exalted in our minds and hearts so that we can simply see what is true, for he is exalted. We pray, Father, for those in this room who don't know Christ. We ask for their salvation. But we gather as your people, and so we ask for the edification and the upbuilding of your people. And we pray that today would be a day where we are washed by the pure water of your word and where our lives are wandering, where our feet have wandered into sinful pathways, where we are stumbling, that today would be a day of repentance and restoration, and not only correction, but instruction in the way in which we should walk. Lord, would you move mightily in this next hour? Would you help us to grasp the things that you've revealed for us? We will give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. It is Thursday night. Christ is sharing the Passover meal with his disciples, and it is a a night that he has longed for, he has greatly desired. Luke 22, 15 says, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Literally, I have desired with desire, epithumia. Epithumesa, I have desired with desire, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. His desire relates to several things. On this night, Christ will celebrate the final legitimate Passover with his disciples. I say it's the final legitimate Passover because Christ is the Passover lamb who fulfills what the Passover pictured. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. It is the end of an era. For 1,500 years, the Passover had been celebrated. Millions of lambs had been sacrificed. And now Christ, the Lamb of God, fulfills it. 
What he does on this night speaks of the end of the old covenant and the inauguration of the new. On this night, Christ will institute the Lord's Supper. From this night forward, the people of God do not memorialize the Passover, but the sacrificial death of the Son of God that brings us the forgiveness of our sins. We celebrate not a temporal deliverance, the deliverance of a nation by the blood of lambs, but we celebrate an eternal and personal deliverance from our sins, from the wrath of God by the blood of the Lamb of God, the Son of God. Now we remember His body, we remember His blood that was offered for us. We remember this until He returns. Isn't it a joy to know that you're forgiven? (laughs) Isn't it a joy to know that all those things of which you are now ashamed, things that are inexcusable, things that are unbelievable in terms of their offense to God and in terms of what we deserve, isn't it wonderful to know that all those things have been paid for in full by the blood of Jesus? You are truly, truly fully forgiven if you know Christ. We celebrate that in the Lord's Supper. And on this night, Christ will teach His disciples final lessons, preparatory lessons that they will carry with them beyond the cross, beyond the resurrection, beyond the ascension into the church age. From John chapter 13 through John chapter 17, we read the upper room discourse. We read of the instruction that Jesus gave his disciples on this night, and it's one tremendous lesson after another. It's it's one lesson after another that that the church has benefited from ever since. John chapter 13, Christ taught humble servanthood as he washed the feet of his disciples. He taught the preeminent quality that will mark his disciples, namely our love one for another. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, by your love for one another. He predicted Peter's denial. Then in John chapter 14, he gave the famous promise that he was going away to prepare a place for his people, but if he goes away, he will gather them to himself. He will come again and gather them to himself and and we will be with him forever. There he announces that he's the way, the truth, and the life when Thomas wondered out loud about the way to the place where he was going. He answers Philip's desire to see the Father with the truth that he and the Father are one and that if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. He gave the promise that he will send the Holy Spirit. He will not leave them orphans. He will come to them in the person of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 15, you you have the famous teaching about the vine and the branches. And you have the famous teaching about, about greater love. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And you are my friends, Jesus says to his disciples. And in John 15, he taught that a slave is not greater than his master. The disciples can expect to suffer along with Christ. In John 16, you have more warnings about persecution. You have more promises about the coming spirit. You have the promise of the resurrection. You have the promise of what life will be like on the other side of the resurrection. And then in John chapter 17, you have Christ's high priestly prayer. What a night. He fulfills the Passover. He institutes the Lord's Supper. What he does speaks of the end of one era, the old covenant era. He he inaugurates a new era, the new covenant era, and he gives intimate instruction that will prepare his men for what they will soon face and for the lives that they will live on the other side of the cross and the empty tomb. This is a profound gathering, and he has longed for it. He has desired with desire to have this time with them. And he knows that he's about to suffer. He states that. 
On the very next day, when the Passover lambs are being sacrificed by those who live in Judea, Christ will be crucified. And so here he is giving a great gift to his church on the night before he suffers, giving a great gift to us by which we will be able to remember his suffering, remember what he has done to make us right with God, remember what his blood has purchased. We're going to consider Mark's account of this night under three headings, verses 22 through 26, We'll look at under three headings. Number one, what we are witnessing. Just want us to recognize what we are witnessing. Number two, why we have received it. Why Christ gave this to us. And number three, as a result, what we now anticipate. What we are witnessing, why we have received it, and what we now anticipate. Looking at verse 22, and as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What is this? What are we witnessing? This is something taking place during the Passover meal. Notice the Bible says, as they were eating, he took bread. He is gathered with his disciples for the Passover feast. They are in the midst of that when Jesus does what he does. Many commentators have given us sort of a step-by-step of what would, would have taken place during the Passover meal at the time of Christ. Let me just briefly sort of summarize that. It would begin with a prayer of thanks, followed by a cup of wine that was diluted with water. Following that first cup of wine would have been the washing of hands. This was both an actual cleansing of the hands. They would eat with their hands. And so it was the washing of hands that had a practical purpose, but also a ceremonial washing of hands at the same time, reminded of the fact that they approached this feast with the need of holiness, with the need of cleansing, aware of their sins. And then after they had washed their hands, there, there, would, have, there would have been the eating of bitter herbs The breaking of bread, the flat bread would have been broken and distributed. They would use this bread to dip in a paste made of fruit and nuts. And then they would sing. In fact, throughout this evening, they would sing what has been referred to as the Hallel. Psalms 113 through 118. And so they would have sung Psalm 113 and 114 at this stage of the meal. Then there would have been a second cup of wine followed by the main course, the roasted lamb. And then a third cup, and then more singing, and then a final cup, and then they closed with a hymn. And so as we read what happened here, when it says he took bread, this is following the initial prayer, this is following the first cup, this is following the ceremonial washing of hands. He, he breaks the flat bread, he distributes it to the disciples, and now he gives it a brand new significance. What are we witnessing? Well, we're witnessing the transformation of something that came before. The transformation of the Passover, as now Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper. In other words, he makes use of the elements of the Passover feast to institute this new thing. Kent Hughes, commenting on this, said this, When the meal had been completely laid out before them with the roast lamb as the centerpiece, the host, in this case Jesus, interpreted each of the foods on the table as it related to their deliverance from Egypt. The bitter herbs recalled their bitter slavery The stewed fruit by its color and consistency recalled the misery of making bricks for Pharaoh. The roasted lamb brought to their remembrance the lamb's blood applied to the doorposts 
their eating of the lamb within the house, and the death angels passing over them as it destroyed the firstborn of Egypt. We do not have a record of the words of Jesus' explanation, but we believe that it went beyond any ever given before this time. It prepared them for the coming words of institution. With the explanation complete, Jesus, as family head, sat erect from his reclining position, took a piece of the unleavened bread, and pronounced this blessing. Praised be thou, O Lord, sovereign of the world, who causes bread to come forth from the earth. To which the apostles responded, Amen. Jesus then broke the bread, which was then distributed in silence from hand to hand around the table. During this silence, Jesus shattered the Passover custom with the radical words recorded in verse 22 of our text, Take it, this is my body. Close quote. Taking something that they would have been familiar with and now pronouncing words that that were unfamiliar take, this is my body. The transformation of something that came before. Second, we're witnessing the fulfillment of something that was prefigured in what came before. This is my body. This is my blood. This is clearly the the language of symbolism. Christ is there. He's right there with them in his body. So when he says, this is my body, he's not speaking in literal terms. When he says, this is my blood, he's not speaking in literal terms. In fact, after the, they take from the cup and he says, this is my blood, look at, look at verse 24, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. It's clear he's speaking symbolically because he goes on to say in verse 25, truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine, right? What they're drinking is wine. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So he's taking bread and using it to symbolize his body. He is taking wine and using it to symbolize his blood. He has spoken like this before. In John chapter 2, he speaks of his body as the temple. In John chapter 6, he speaks of himself as the bread of life, which came down from heaven. In John chapter 10, he speaks of himself as the door. In John chapter 15, he speaks of himself as a vine. This is not literal speech. This is figurative speech. This is symbolic speech. And so we just want to say it is, it is Roman Catholic mysticism and heresy that would argue for the false doctrine of transubstantiation. You know they teach that this bread becomes the actual body of Jesus and and the wine becomes the actual blood of Christ. And that is a lie. John Calvin didn't spare them any wrath when he wrote this, quote, and certainly it is a strange inversion when a mortal man who is commanded to take the body of Christ, claims the office of offering it. And thus, a priest who has been appointed by himself, Calvin making the point that there is no priesthood today as that which is envisioned in the Roman Catholic heresy, a priest who has been appointed by himself sacrifices to God his own son. I do not at present inquire with how many acts of sacrilege their pretended offering abounds. It is sufficient for my purpose that it is so far from approaching to Christ's institution that it is directly opposed to it. He's right. So the significance of the elements is a symbolic significance, but the fellowship represented at the table is real. The elements are symbolic in nature, but the fellowship is real. That is to say, the Lord meets with us at the table as we remember Him. Uh, We did not plan, by the way, that we would be taking the Lord's Supper today when we arrived at this passage. It would have taken enormous planning on my part, and that's not me. So isn't it sweet when the Lord allows our preaching to match up with our practice? And so today we, we partake of the Lord's table together, and we just need to know that though what we're partaking of is, is pure, purely symbolism, symbolic in nature, yet the fellowship is real. 
because the Lord meets with us here. 1 Corinthians 10, 16 says, the cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation, literally koinonia, is it not a fellowship in the body of Christ? But the fellowship is found in remembrance. The bread and the wine of the Passover observance now speak of something greater than what was pictured in the Passover. The unleavened bread now speaks of the body of Jesus which speaks of the incarnation and the life of Jesus. The wine pictures the blood of Jesus. And as Jesus says, it is his blood that will be poured out, poured out for many. That speaks of his death. And it's not just any kind of death. It is a substitutionary death. The death of the one will accomplish the salvation of the many. So this is the transformation of something that came before. It is the fulfillment of something that was prefigured in what came before. Third, if we ask, what are we witnessing? We're witnessing the giving of something that is to be appropriated. The giving of something that is to be appropriated. Jesus says, take, this is my body. By the way, there is no significance in the breaking In fact, the Bible makes the point, as was prophesied in the Old Testament, that not one of his bones would be broken. So there's no significance found in the breaking of the bread. It was just the way to distribute the bread. The significance is found in what the bread symbolizes, the body of Jesus. And they all take of the body and they eat of the body symbolized in the bread. And they all take of the cup, and they partake of that. The Bible says, verse 23, he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they drank, they all drank of it. And the word all is at the end of that sentence in the Greek text, emphasizing the fact that they all took of it. The fact that they all ingest it speaks of what Christ will be to his people. He is our life. He is our spiritual food. As we receive Him, we receive life. And then we go on, as it were, feeding on Him. And in the supper, we remember that, that He is our life. John 6, 48 says this, I'm the bread of life. Your fathers ate the man in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? When you think about transubstantiation, you're actually thinking in, in the very blind literal terms that his opponents were thinking in. So Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like the bread the fathers ate and died. Whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. We feed on Christ as we receive him initially by faith. We receive him as Lord and Savior. But then we go on living our lives feeding on him, which is to say we go on believing in him. We feed on Him by remembering the truth as it is in Him. And so we feed on Him as we believe His words and we feed on His words. And those who are alive go on living because of who Jesus is and what He's done forever and ever and ever. This is what we're witnessing. Leads to the second thought this morning, why have we received it? Why did Christ give this to us? Why has the Lord's Supper been given to the church? Well, the Lord tells us why. It is to remember His death. 
And we'll talk about this in a moment. Every time we celebrate the Lord's table, we also remember his resurrection. But what is, what is proclaimed through these elements is the sacrifice of Christ. What is proclaimed is the death of Christ. Luke twenty two nineteen 19 says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he tells us what the significance of this gift to the church is, is so that we would go on remembering, gathering up in our, in our minds not just the facts of what occurred, but the significance of those facts. Not just that Jesus died, but what his death means. He gave his body for us, and we're to remember him, and in that way remember that, which he did for us. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. No longer do the people of God serve under the old covenant. Now we serve under a new agreement, as it were, something established by God, wherein we know the full forgiveness of our sins by the one sacrifice of Jesus, no longer offering all of those animal sacrifices that pointed to the sacrifice of Christ. Now He has come. Now He has died. Now He has been raised. Now He has ascended into heaven. It is finished. It is accomplished. And we live our lives standing in grace because of what Jesus has done. This is my body which is given for you. This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The death of Christ has fulfilled what the old covenant promised through all those animal sacrifices, the forgiveness of sins, sins truly atoned for. And so it is ushered in a new covenant in which there are no more sacrifices to be offered. The one true and perfect sacrifice has been given. And we have the Spirit of God now living within our lives. Covenants are ratified by blood. The Noahic covenant ratified by blood, Genesis chapter 8. The Abrahamic covenant ratified by blood, Genesis 15. The Mosaic covenant ratified by blood, Exodus 24, Leviticus 17. And now Christ's blood, not the blood of bulls and goats and animals, but Christ's blood ratifies the new covenant. This is the new covenant in my blood. He has finished what is necessary to save us. All of the other pointed to him, foreshadowed what he would do. Now he has come and and fulfilled it. And so what we remember is that his blood has reconciled us to God. We don't just remember the, the facts. We don't just remember even the significance of the facts in a generic way, we remember, as we take, partake of this gift that He's given to the church, we remember what it means for us. What it means, if I can say it this way, what it, what it means for me. What it means for you. Christ gave His life to save me. His blood was shed to forgive my sin. Yes, and all of yours as well who trust in the Son of God. He forgave us all, but I don't want to miss the fact that He forgave me of all of my sins. Calvin said this, The godly ought by all means to keep this rule whenever they see the symbols, to think and be persuaded that the truth is surely present there. For why should the Lord put in your hand the symbol of His blood except to assure you of a true participation in it? In other words, as we take the cup, we will benefit most by saying in our hearts, yes, I really am forgiven, and resting in the objective fact. Why does He put the bread into our hands except to remind us that He came from heaven to earth and lived and died for us? And why would He put the the symbol of His blood into our hand except that those who have trusted in Him should be assured that the truth is here, that my sins have really been atoned for? This is how we should think as we partake of what He gave on this night as a gift to His church. 
Why did he give it? To remember him, to remember his death. Second, to celebrate our shared life in Christ. To celebrate our shared life in Christ. So I do think of my own sins and the reality of their forgiveness, but now I also think about all of you. I think about the family of God. I think about the body of Christ. I think about what we share together. We all sit at the same table. We all partake of the same bread and drink. We all, that's what he emphasized here with his disciples, they all drank of it. We all take it in. This is why it's so important that you fence the table. This is why we talk about the fact that if you have not yet received Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are not to partake of the Lord's table. Your need is to partake of the Lord. Because what we're celebrating at this table is that we all share the same Lord, the same life, the same forgiveness, the same fellowship. This is a table for fellowship. If you don't know Christ, you don't belong to the fellowship yet. You're outside the fellowship. Isn't it instructive that Judas was dismissed from the room before Jesus instituted the supper? The men who partook of this supper were believers. Judas was not there. Because the supper is not for unbelievers. It's for true disciples. So to remember his death, to celebrate our shared life in Christ. Third, to remember the resurrection and the promise of his return. As Paul applies this in the life of the Corinthian church, he says that we partake of this until the Lord comes. And even here on this night, Jesus looks beyond the cross, beyond the resurrection to a future day. Verse 25, truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the, that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This is beyond the cross and beyond the resurrection. He, he's declaring his triumph before he ever dies. And so in this way, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So the very fact that we partake of the Lord's table is our confession as a church that we believe that Jesus not only died for our sins, but has been raised from the dead bodily, has ascended into heaven, and is coming again. Every time we partake of it, we say we are looking forward to the return of Christ. And so we remember the fact that our Savior lives. What are we witnessing? The transformation of something that existed before, the fulfillment of something that was prefigured in what existed before, the institution of something new that speaks of a new era, the new covenant in Christ's blood. Why did he give this to the church? To remember what he did to make us right with God, to remember our shared life in him, and to remember the fact that he's coming again. So that now, third point, we see what we anticipate. What do we now anticipate? Verse 25, truly, whenever you see that, it's just Christ is underscoring something. Be assured of this. Be confident of this. Let this be your sure expectation. Let this be your hope because I'm telling you the truth. I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine. Now, we know that Jesus ate and drank after his resurrection. So what he's talking about is this supper that he has instituted. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When he says, I will not drink it. And I drink it. He, he presents himself as the host, just as he is the one who is hosting on this night. So there will be a day when we all gather with the Lord Jesus and he's the host. He is, he is absolutely conscious of his identity as the Messiah, isn't he? He not only institutes this, but he's going to one day share it with us again. And he's announcing, as I said, his triumph before he dies. And there will come a day in the kingdom when we celebrate a true Passover together, not the Passover out of, out of Egypt, 
not the Exodus, but we're going to celebrate the Passover with the one true lamb, our Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus. We will commemorate why we are all there in His very presence. Do you know that's real? Do you know that's true? Do you know that day is coming? Today, when we partake of the Lord's table, can we look forward to that day? <laughs> can we envision that day when now we do it in remembrance by faith? But there's coming a day when we will all do this, not just together, but with Him. And what has been faith will now be sight. And what we have anticipated will then be reality the Lord's table tells us that the cross was not the end of the story. It looks back at what Christ has done. It looks forward to Christ's return. And it brings these two realities into the present as we gather into our minds and hearts the significance of what He's done and the reality of the salvation that we now know because of Him, the forgiveness of our sins. And after they finished, they sang a hymn, verse 26. Likely the final psalm of the traditional Hallel, Psalm 118. And then what he had memorialized in advance, he walks out of that room to accomplish. What he has memorialized in advance, this is my body, this is my blood, he now goes forth to give for you and me. He didn't run when he saw the wolf coming. The good shepherd laid down his life for his sheep. He loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the very end. No greater love has any man than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And Jesus laid down his life for his friends. And if you know him, that is why you are right with God today. That is the reason we gather in a place like this to worship. That's why a gathering like this one is not just worth an hour and a half. It's worth all your time every day. This challenges, doesn't it, our westernized, streamlined version of Christianity where I think I give the Lord an hour out of my week. No, dear ones, for to me, to live is Christ. He is the bread that came down from heaven. He not only has, has brought me life, He's how I live as I feed on Him by faith. Who He is, what He's done, what truth is in Him. This is how I live. And so today when we partake of this table, we will celebrate our life as we celebrate the one who gave himself to give us life. And the church would say, amen. amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for our Savior, for the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Thank you, Father, that his death atoned for all of the sins of all of those who will ever put their faith in him that our sins have truly been answered for, that you are both just and the justifier of ungodly people, so that despite what we are now ashamed of, the shamefulness of it, the offense of it, the hatefulness of our sins, despite that reality, forgiveness is just as real. And where sins abounded, Lord, your grace superabounded, and you have forgiven us and made us right with yourself through the finished work of Christ. In this we glory, in this we rejoice, in this we celebrate. This is what we remember.
as we gather around this table to fellowship with our Savior. We give you praise for these truths in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.